Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, I want to address one of the main factors that impacts the strength of London dispersion forces between molecules, and that is the shape of the molecule. In particular, I want to address the differences between linear and nonlinear molecules, as well as some special cases involving double bonds and rings. Let's get started. As an introduction to the concept of London dispersion forces being a function of molecular shape, I want to consider the following charged surfaces below. First, on the left, we have these two charged plates, one negative and one positive. As you can see indicated by the purple arrows, these plates feel an attractive force along their entire length due to the symmetric distribution of charge across the entire surface area. On the other hand, if we look to the right, we see these two charged spheres. While they also experience an electrostatic interaction, we see far fewer arrows between them. This is because the electric force is very strongly distance dependent. Assuming the charge distribution remains how it is on the spheres and does not shift, only the charges along the inner edges of the spheres are really participating in the attraction. The others are simply too far apart. If you look again at the plates on the left, their flat shape allows the entire charged surface area to approach very closely to the opposite plate, leading to much stronger forces as indicated by the uh, number of purple arrows. Conversely, with the spheres, the overall charges cannot get anywhere near as close due to the geometry since the spheres will bump at the inside edge, which appreciably weakens the force, hence far fewer arrows. We can see very tangible impacts of this phenomenon if we look at some example molecules. From our geometric understanding, we would expect linear molecules, which are similar to our plates, to have a larger interaction area and therefore have stronger LDFs and higher boiling points. This is because boiling point correlates directly with intermolecular force strength, and if the molecules are nonpolar, LDFs are really the only forces to consider. Now, on the other hand, if we go ahead and look at bulkier molecules or nonlinear molecules, we're going to have less contact area, more like our spheres, and ultimately expect lower boiling points. To make our comparison more clear, let's look at three isomers of the molecule pentane, which is C5H12. It's important to compare isomers so that the electron clouds are all the same size, since electron cloud size also affects LDFs, and we want to control so we're only looking at shape. Our first species that we're going to look at is n-pentane, which is a linear chain with a boiling point of around 36 Celsius. Now, if we go ahead and move towards a slightly branched isomer, isopentane, we see the boiling point decreases somewhat to about 28 degrees Celsius. No changes have occurred in the electron cloud size or the polarity of the molecule, but predictably, as the molecule has become more branched or bulky, the LDFs have become weakened due to the lower surface area, and the boiling point has dropped. Next, looking at neopentane, which is a tetrahedral-shaped molecule with an even bulkier shape, we see the boiling point has plummeted even further to about 9 degrees Celsius. This again matches our predictions and shows how drastically shape can influence dispersion force strength for a given molecular formula. To really drive home this point, I wanted to dissect the electron cloud interactions here in a bit more detail. So when we consider the molecule n-pentane shown here on the left, its electron cloud is going to roughly follow the shape of the chain in an elliptical pattern, which we can see here on the right. Now, if we were to have these two molecules approach one another, while it is possible for them to approach end on, it's much more favorable for them to stack up, uh, to stack up long side over long side as shown below. This way, the maximum surface area of each electron cloud is exposed to the other one. This in turn maximizes the effect of transient dipoles that are created when this electron cloud probabilistically skews towards one side of the molecule. The closer the overall mo molecular structure can get, the more partial positive and negative charges can be brought into the interaction distance between the transient and induced dipoles, and therefore, the stronger the attractive force, as indicated by these purple arrows, that we're going to get between these two molecules. Now, on the other hand, if we go ahead and look at the neopentane structure, which we see here on the left, its 3D molecular structure is actually tetrahedral, and so its electron cloud is going to be quasi-spherical, as we can see on the right. Predictably, just like our previous sphere example, these two electron clouds cannot approach each other in a very favorable geometry, 
and are limited to the amount of interaction that they can have, right? These purple arrows show that we have a much weaker interaction than with the linear n-pentane species. So just to summarize what we have talked about so far, based on these molecules, n-pentane, isopentane, and neopentane, for going from left to right, we see a clear and strong correlation between surface area, dispersion force strength, and boiling point. And this is all corroborated by experimental data, which shows that neopentane, being the bulkiest, has a far, far lower boiling point than n-pentane, which is the straight chain isomer. So at this point, you may have some questions about when such shape considerations may actually matter from a more practical standpoint. One such example is in a biological setting. So we can consider three different fatty acids, molecules that make up the fats in your body, including the phospholipids of the cell membrane. These hydrocarbons can come in three varieties. The first is saturated, which means that it has a, uh, no double bonds and a long, roughly linear molecular shape. The next is a trans-unsaturated fatty acid, which is going to have a roughly linear geometry similar to the saturated fat on the left, because the double bonds are going to have the long chain on opposite sides. So we end up with, again, a straight chain. Our third molecule is going to be the cis-unsaturated fat, which has its double bonds in a cis orientation, meaning that the long parts of the chain are on the same side in this case. So trans is on the opposite side, cis is going to be on the same side, and this uh, geometry is going to lead to a lot of bending and kinking of the chain. So we're going to end up with a very convoluted molecular shape that's much bulkier than the saturated or trans fats. This is going to raise, uh, sorry, because the saturated and trans fats have a roughly linear shape, they can pack together relatively efficiently, and they're going to have a large surface area of interaction, meaning they're going to have a higher boiling point. On the other hand, the cis unsaturated fats are far less efficient at packing and have a lower boiling point being more liquid at body temperature, whereas the saturated and trans hydrocarbons are going to be more solid at body temperature. Now, why does this all matter? Well, say you're an animal that lives in a colder climate and needs to insulate yourself from ice and snow. Do you want your cell membrane to be made of fats with a higher or lower freezing temperature? Lower, right? That way your cells don't go and freeze solid due to the outside temperature. So in that case, you would want more unsaturated fats, those fats with lower freezing temperatures, to be in your cell membrane. This also matters from the point of view of our heart health, for example, as the denser, more solid, saturated, and trans fats are more likely to solidify in your arteries, constricting blood flow. This just goes to show the macroscopic effects of these microscopic properties influencing London dispersion forces. Now, to finish up, I want to go ahead and introduce a unique problem that seems to violate what we've been talking about. Now, in reality, it doesn't. It actually follows the pattern rather nicely, but you just have to be keenly aware of some three-dimensional structures. Cycloalkanes, that is, hydrocarbon chains that are circular or ring-shaped, have a slightly lower molar mass than straight-chain hydrocarbon alkanes. Because of this smaller electron cloud, and perhaps because they're not linear, we would rightfully expect that they're going to have a lower boiling point. But it turns out that they do not. Instead, we observe the opposite. Uh, so if we go ahead and look at n-pentane here, as 5-carbon straight chain, it has a boiling point of about 36 degrees Celsius. Now, if we go ahead and look at n-hexane, one carbon longer, predictably, because we've increased the electron cloud size, the boiling point has increased to about 68 degrees Celsius. Right? The problem is that if we now look at cyclopentane, this ring-shaped uh, five-carbon chain, its boiling point is almost 50 degrees Celsius, which is about 15 degrees higher than the straight-chain isomer, which is odd, to say the least. And then if we look at cyclohexane, this uh, six-carbon ring, it's even higher still, at 80 degrees Celsius. So something is going on here that's not obvious from the geometries that we've spoken about so far and we should discuss what that is. Well, it turns out that this has to do with the ability of single bonds to rotate at room temperature, right? Sigma bonds can rotate freely about uh, each other at STP, 
which means that straight chain alkanes are going to have many conformations that they can adopt. And we can see some of these alternate structures below as parts of the chain spin circularly around the connecting single bonds while other parts of the chain remain fixed in place. And I want to emphasize these conformers or conformational isomers are the exact same molecule. They're not different uh, structures. They're the same molecule that's being bended and twisted due to their thermal energy at room temperature. And so while the conformer on the left packs efficiently, it's a straight chain, the ones on the right certainly do not. They are not linear, they're very bulky. And at room temperature, there is going to be a mix of all of these different conformers in a given sample of, say, N-hexane. So while the one on the left might be the most common because it's the least strained, it's not all bended and twisted, the other ones are actually present in sufficient amounts to disrupt the packing efficiency of this substance, right? The conformers on the right do not pack efficiently, and they are going to lower the boiling point of the substance, rather substantially, actually. Now, it turns out cycloalkane rings cannot unfold. They cannot rotate freely. They are, quote-unquote, ring-locked. And so, for example, the cyclohexane ring may not be, uh, is actually confined to oscillate between these two conformations. It just flips back and forth between these two what are known as chair structures. And so, although they may not be linear, because they do not have any uh, contributions from these weird bulky conformers, they overall actually pack more efficiently than the straight chain alkanes, especially in liquid form when they're able to move around and slosh back and forth. So, because of this more efficient packing, cycloalkanes are going to have significantly stronger LDFs and a much higher boiling point. If anything, this weird uh, side effect of uh, conformational switching just goes to show how tricky and full of finesse the chemical world can be and how much we need to pay attention to these microscopic factors. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure to check out our other videos on the chemistry playlist to learn more. And if you're looking to branch out into other subject areas, check out our other science playlists. Thank you so much for your time and see you next time.